Because we've been having some coffee instead of on. Okay. Oh, okay. I think I did, was just given another slide about another announcement. Possibly the fact that we may be having a group photo sometime, but with but more information, you'll be forthcoming about that. Um, a very, is this? Oh, okay. The brand name we're doing is about the lake. I like this kind of, we think of it and it happens. This is virus for you. Okay, so a great time. Everybody go outside, put on your lipstick and uh, your best clothes, and we have a group photograph. Um, just to remind do you that uh, we have at one o'clock today uh, some sessions which aren't, uh, don't have all the information on the back of the orange book because we've not been updating what we do. So Vimtree is going to be giving us an IRS, uh, is going to be leading an IRS talk shop on the future of Zygon. I have to give you some uh, information later on the precise venue of that because uh, we were scheduled for in here an important something is happening here at one o'clock. So um, I will get back to you on the venue. And uh, Piper, one of our students, is doing an RS white science session. That's going, to, uh, that's going to be in the, in the boat house. I think, Piper, can we do that at break time? When we have coffee? Or do you just say it now? We have, can we do 30 seconds? Yeah, that's what I Okay. Saying. So um, it's going to give you a right size Oh, yeah, I know you're going to give you a slide set, but um, when we talk a little bit about certain notions of sort of identity that comes through the practice of eating, and um, one of the things I'm really interested in is I'm beginning to explore this, where I really would love to have folks who want to show up and have some sort of points of entry or analysis or stuff that they've done that they can share with me to help sort of maybe guide me as I'm just beginning to explore this. So for me, it'd be really helpful if folks who you know are interested or know stuff or whatever come and come with your ideas and come with resources and theory and all that stuff and sort of just like school me. That's what I'm looking for. So I hope that you will you will give me that opportunity to learn from all of you. Okay, so ours um Piper is one of our scholars and one of the reasons we have scholars here with us is so that we can support and encourage them in their own development and their own academic work. So it would be really great to see people turning up to encourage and support Piper at that session. Okay, I'm done. If I have other notices, I will give them at coffee time. Okay. Thank you. Welcome to you all. Welcome back. We have a, uh, another talk today, this morning, plenary session, and it's by Barry Brenton. Uh, Barry is a professor, at, at, as you can see right here, in fact, it's right here at St. John's University in Queens, New York. Uh, he comes here also with his uh, wife and child, uh, and I hope his wife is here, but I don't know yet. Yes, she is. Uh, so please just raise your hand so we can all see you. Thank you. Okay. And um, and what I would like you to think about is, is that he represents a very unique position that the that St. John's University, where he is a professor of anthropology, also has a direct connection to the uh, uh, to the educational institutions of the uh, uh, of the Vatican, and so he he commutes back and forth between the Vatican uh, and a very special program that he runs for educating people from all over the world there uh, that come there and then fan out through the rest of the world. So he has a very unique conception of what the issues are uh, and particularly the issues around what exists at that special program of the Vatican where social justice is at the heart of it. And his specialty, of course, is, is food and nutrition, and so what we have is a unique synthesis uh, on the topic of food sovereignty and environmental nutrition as a foundation of food justice and sustainable food systems. So this is a very unique presentation that in, in a sense extends what we've already been talking about in the way, so I'm looking forward very much to hearing uh, from Mary. Thank you. Good morning. 
obviously no connection to the bathroom is ever correct, so. <laughs> it's always a direct connection with the reactor. But, uh, I'll, actually, I'll talk a little bit maybe later by the time, sort of our work, particularly with Catholic Relief Services in the U.S. Catholic Conference of Bishops. And that links up as well to our graduate program. But for first, though, I'm going to start, I'm an anthropologist. And Saul doesn't know this, actually, but I thought I'd start out with a little peaky update, kind of roll us back to where we were yesterday. And, you know, the emphasis I wanted to bring up is Saul way out this wonderful terminology of an ethnobore, think in the context of peaky, this very nutritious food, this lifestyle that hope in the desert, but the symbolism of the blue, the symbolism of the women who make it in their marriage, in this relationship between the biology and culture behind that. But I wanted to add uh, a little stress to those points. And one is that the peaky stones themselves archaeologically come about the same time we see the first iconography for symbols of the Kachina cult, which is the primary foundation of open religion today, Kachina spirits. And peaky stones, Kachina spirits, and that relationship also is bound together when we see this sort of development of Hopi culture from the past. You can see here about 1300 to 1600 AD. The other thing I wanted to bring up quickly is because Saul and I both have such a passion for corn, uh, my students would say, can you talk about anything else but I said, how else can one see the world today? If not to the is, you know, thinking about corn. And I want to bring up this, some questions came up about pellagra and how many things, I don't want to digress too much, but just the fact that this was a horrible impact on American society, particularly the American South. It was a disease of poverty. Saul mentioned Joseph Goldberg, his great work very early on. He hit it right on the nail. It went into perfect public health experiment to stop it. Why did it take so long? Well, it's all didn't mention because a lot of factors in America, America South, this is the early 20th century, not so long beyond the time of the Civil War or the War between the States or the War of Northern Aggression, having referred to it now on this 150th year. But it was the fact that Goldberger not only came from the North, seen as a Yankee, he was also seen as a Jew, a Jewish doctor, who didn't quite set well with the Southern medical establishment. And part of the ignoring all of this research and work was based in that sort of, of that time period. Not to mention this is the time of the revving up the eugenics movement. Now the eugenics fit very well into why poor people have all these diseases is because they pass it on to each other, right? And this notion of even our immigration laws, et cetera, and things like that. But I just want to show this applaud mortality and come back to the point I wanted to make is particularly amongst women that they died at a rate consistently double that of men. The morbidity rate for pellagra was up to 10 times higher for women than for men. So if hoping women had anything at stake, making sure they were persisting at Piki, they had a high stakes involved in their own nutrition and the old impact to avoid this disease of pellagra. And particularly if you look decade by decade in terms of the life cycle, and here's sort of a, a chart showing ages just for a 10 year period of mortality. Remember that morbidity rates were much, much higher than this, and so it came seasonally um, in the American South. But I want to point out that you see a rapid rise in rates of age and and beginning to decline as you move towards age and menopause. Once quickly, you can see for men it's pretty much stable in terms of those mortality rates across the board. But for women, you see this curve. And what's interesting about that is we do know from experiments, uh, clinical experiments, that actually estrogen blocks this tryptophan to niacin conversion, as Saul mentioned briefly yesterday, we had a cut it. But a lot of our data niacin has gotten from the amino acid tryptophan. And that being blocked, specifically in a marginal diet, you find that being blocked, it's no doubt that you have a combination of not only the issues of sex, biologically, in terms of estrogen production, but I always like to think this is also a question of gender. Because we also know in the American South, the eating habits of women, women and families around the world, and the gender, and food, and nutritional status of women themselves, is heavily impacted by making sure that the, the husband may be working in those hot mills in the South, for example, or the children themselves are the first to get any kind of milk or any kind of what we'll call it, protein in the diet, and women will be last. So I'm not saying it's a deterministic sex issue in terms of why we diet the women. I think it's a synergistic relationship between the biology of estrogen blocking one big major pathway you have to get nice, which is not coming in the form, it's not processed, but also you have the impact of the questions of gender and the women's role in the family and her own eating habits with respect to the responsibility of non food preparing in relationship to what she's eating herself. So I want to throw that out to sort of 
support that this kind of great relationship between the new model and the things. All right, now I'll get into things. Uh, the notion of sustainable development. And obviously, we have a very simple version of this. The EU needs the present without compromising building future generations to meet their own needs. And the UN World Commission the first made statements in this. And there's other versions of this, thinking about sustainability also in the context of the way we treat the environment, at least the way it treats itself and vice versa, this need for lifestyles, and thinking about sustainability in terms of our own sort of quest for things, you know, the common growth and the common good as it might be, making those choices and investments. And that's something that I think we'll continue to talk about for this week in terms of our own personal and social responsibility in terms of you know, meeting that these issues with respect to world food problems, where do we stand on this thing? Particularly when it comes to trying to define a sustainable food system, now we all know it's a very delicate balance between needing to improve lifestyles, building the well-being on one hand, preserving those natural resources and ecosystems on which we and future generations depend on the other hand. The real issue, of course, comes up here is how do you make a sustainable food system when people want to consume more meat? They will be going through this rapid dietary transition we see in the brick countries in Brazil, Russia, India, China, rapid dietary change. But is that done in such a sustainable way? But in the same hand, as, as we do not curb much of our own consumption patterns in the United States, the waste pattern we know much more about, is the idea that uh, you know, as Americans, we think about sustainable development, but yet when people in other countries are beginning to reach a certain level of economic, sort of economy, economic development, that they're uh, able to really afford now the sort of more luxury foods that might be particularly when it comes to, to meat. It has an incredible impact, as we know, on the ecosystem in terms of, like we saw one of the talks after lunchtime was about water. It's an incredible amount of water that goes into like, meat production. It's huge. So how do we make this balance, particularly when we're talking about a sustainable food system, in which more and more of the world is, is demanding more and more, but what, what about their own rights to do that? And so we're going to get into some interesting things to think about, in particular in terms of food policy and notion of sovereignty. I mean, do not these people from the global south, now emerging, especially in the emerging economies, have the same rights to consume as we do? And what's that mean for the future? So, I think holistically, we know that the 2015 deadline is coming quickly. It was never the idea that all countries would even begin to meet these, but it was just the beginning. And I like to look at this more just to remind ourselves that you know, feeding global hunger is right up there at the top priority. This is in but it's linked to all these other factors, and I think we just have to keep reminding ourselves when we talk about global food problems, it has to be constant in this context of issues of poverty, of education, of empowerment, gender empowerment, child mortality, internal health, all the infectious diseases, environmental sustainability, and ultimately the last in their development a global partnership for development, where these developing nations can provide the capacity building for many nations to try to essentially dig into meet these development goals. But you know, right now at the UN, we're doing lots of discussions about what's the next revision, what's the next target date out there that we're going to try to meet. But it's also been important, I think, to see how you know, countries, on one hand, have been trying to track their own internal kind of development uh, challenges as well. But I think at least it keeps an open discussion, at least at the, the UN, to hear these things. One of the things I do at the UN is sit in the OPC and some of the conferences. I know Anita Spring, I often see, she has a small NGO I see here there oftentimes as well. But you know, when you listen to things going at that the UN, it's, it, it's often, you think nothing ever gets done there. But remember, they're not a legal body in terms of making laws. And I think the American public often forgets that. They're just there to provide advice and guidance and provide support for countries to develop in their own way, sort of their own sovereign way. So obviously watching the U.S. This position on things at the UN is disconcerting as a citizen, but I guess part of the democracy is I, I can have something to say about that, at least uh, in my own books and the like. But it's, it was interesting alone just to see how, particularly watching the transition from the Bush to Obama administration, um, some things change, but not much. And the American position just keeps rolling on. And that's sort of, you know, sort of beyond the politics we hear in Washington. There's a larger American politics we have to also reconsider. It comes back to questions of consumption and sort of sustainable development. In other words, we need to shape right at the core across the political spectrum. I think a lot of those we think about the world food system. So really what I wanted to do today was introduce a number of things in the context of really definitional 
So I've, I've tried to like use highlighter or yellow highlighter to oh, oh, oops. It's trying to highlight some of the terminology so don't get lost in the words. Uh, but I think we all, you know, fundamentally think about questions of social justice, this sort of rights-based approach in the context of food access. It's centered on notions of equitable systems of human distribution. It's the notion underlying social justice. It's clearly building a solidarity network that really guarantees the dignity of every human being. That, of course, is the right to food. <laughs> and there's lots of other terms that come along, whether we call it food justice, just food, food democracy, and we'll talk a little bit a bit about food sovereignty. But overall, it's this sort of notion that access to safe and nutritious food is also being in solidarity with this large framework, I think, that can be linked up with notions of environmental justice. So I don't get too much caught up in definitions because I know that this evening in fact Ellen Messer will take us deeply to the politics and also maybe work our way through notions of food rights in particular. I just want to sort of give you the sort of introduction part to that part to set that up. You know, this importance of having the right to regular, permanent, unrestricted access, either directly or means financial purposes of purchases, to quantitatively and qualitatively adequate and sufficient food corresponding to cultural traditions of people which consumer belongs, and which is your physical and mental individual collective ability to buy by three here. Now that's, who else could come up with that with some kind of a human body that those kind of a twist and set of words. But the bottom line is it's really meant in the notion of dignity and access. In fact, what I want to point out is the three main components of that without other details. It's a boil it down, it's really a question of making sure that for food rights there's a question of availability. There needs to be an availability there in the part. Whether that's from agriculture, or hunters and gatherers, or fishing, whatever it might be. But also, it's next, secondly, a question of accessibility. That's both an economic and a physical access to be guaranteed. And also, then the question, the third A really is adequacy, that it can satisfy dietary needs. And that would include, as we heard last night, for example, it is important so that even micronutrient is part of that. It's not just a matter of calories, really, but it's a matter of a larger, diverse diet in and of itself. And there are also questions of food safety that go along with that, uh, with the contaminants, both in industrial and agricultural processes. But it also should be ultimately, and we all appreciate this as an apologist, is that being culturally acceptable. And you know, what does that mean, especially in very pluralistic societies? How do you, as a nation, create a food rights declaration to make sure that you've covered the basis of the diversity, be that religious, cultural, et cetera, uh, within a community? Now, it's interesting because the UN and their Commission on Human Rights, particularly the Right to Food fact sheet in 2010, <laughs> says things that kind of, you know, I think make us sit back and think of it about, well, what is the right to food? And what I would particularly wanted to point out was the right to food is not the same as the right to be fed. Okay, the right to food is not the right to be fed, but primarily the right to feed oneself in dignity. And we kind of parse that all out all day long, but what it's really trying to say is that, you know, what's the government's responsibility? So people are like, oh, I they're going to hand free food out to people, and that's their responsibility. Or is it a question of really availability or accessibility of the issues that came up in the early right to food? And to be honest, and I don't want to get sidetracked at this point, because I'm sure it'll come later in the week about the farm bill, but the reason the House put the farm bill to a nutrition bill, and sort of a farm system type bill, is I think because the politics behind the nutrition part of that which sort of hits right to the head of us about what's Americans' responsibility to have a food secure society or not, particularly with that stamp that it is or what we used to call food stamps. And so this kind of gets you around that. Because I mean, some people feel like you know, food stamps are just feeding people. But is it really feeding people or are you giving them other kinds of rights that are involved with that? At the same time, people often look at the right to food as something different from food security and food sovereignty as well. I mean, there are Concepts are somewhat different, but obviously there's a lot of overlap here. And if you look at the FAO notion of food security, all people have to get physical, social, economic access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious need that meets the bacteria needs. Culture appropriate again, food preference for an active and healthy life. And I think that's an important part of all this I can emphasize is for a healthy and active life. And you know, it's not just a matter of just again meeting the calorie needs, it's that they're having a filled life and active, healthy one. 
So in this way, you can see that food security is sort of a precondition for the subject, for the enjoyment of the right to food is a precondition for that. But it also does not impose obligations on stakeholders in order to provide entitlements to them. You see that the UN speak here is being very careful to try to make sure nations, on one hand, don't draw away from this, but feel like in some ways they have a way, a way around it, as it might be, so they can sort of sign on to this without being fully held accountable. In a sense, that's what it's a lot of and then this concept of food sovereignty, we'll spend a little bit more time on that. And again, from the UN perspective, very short and sweet, that promotes an alternative model for agriculture, trade policies, practices that serve people's rights to food, get safe, healthy, and adding to this sort of ecological, sustainable food production. Again, this right to food sovereignty is recognized under some national laws, but there's no really no international consensus on where that should be brought into that. Part of that is the history behind food sovereignty. I want to kind of Redefine it again in the historical context of how food sovereignty has been, been used and conceptualized. And like you've kind of seen that <laughs> this international peasants movement that launched this idea, coined the food sovereignty as a term at the World Food Summit in 1996. And so here it's the rights of people to a healthy and culturally appropriate food produced through sustainable methods and their right to define their own food systems. And that's sort of the short of it. And I think that includes those notions of the right to food in part, that it's healthy, it's culture appropriate, but also it's adding to that this notion of looking at this larger food system that's produced in a sustainable way. And not only that, but more importantly, as a sovereign issue here, is that people have the right to define their own food systems. So what this sort of turns into is you can see an emphasis is often then on a model of development, sustainable development of food systems at a small scale, looking more at the local sustainable production, the benefits communities, and again, the environment and the ecology as you can consistently put into this. But it puts aspirations, needs, and livelihoods of those who produce, distribute, and consume the food at the heart of the food system, and policies rather than demands of markets and corporations. You can see this sort of anti-corporate. In many ways, it's so sort of anti-globalization of the food system movement is what it's really become. But it tries to ensure the rights and social sovereignty of people's ability to manage their lands and territories, but also to manage their own water and seeds and livestock and biodiversity. Their ultimate will should be in the hands of those people who are the producers, not the corporate sector. And you can see where this is going to the notion of sovereignty. It's not just a matter of growing what you want to grow. It's the whole system in which food is produced and consumed. And so it's the movement itself is trying looking at a very genuine agrarian reform about how we do agriculture in the world. Is whether it's our priority as an ultimate as a farmer's movement. So I wanted to link to this notion of in sovereignty in the question of looking at terms like and use in the context of environmental nutrition, which kind of puts together and emphasizes both the sort of ecosystem ecological con context of how food is produced, but also the nutritional side, the sort of the, the biological side of nutrition. And the way we see environmental nutrition often defined is it's optimizing health, so that the nutrition part's going to be right out. It's looking at questions of health and promoting nutritious food and clean water as well in a secure, accessible, and sustainable food system. So, sort of wrapping up these notions, we'll see other terms that are used and utilized to make sure they integrate the notions of health and ecology and rights. Now, it's defined as a sustainable and resilient food system that conserves and renews the natural resources. Clearly, that's defined as a sustainable agricultural system, but it also advances social justice, animal welfare, fulfills the food nutrition needs of all eaters now and in the future. So that's sort of where environmental nutrition is looking at the nutritional side of these things uh, in terms of not just having calories, but you can link this up to the next term I have here, our questions of, of dietary diversity and what I like to think more in the side of dietary biodiversity. It's a way we can start thinking about this more and more. And that's this notion of access to a consumption of a wide spectrum of food products originating from within traditional local and a regional food system and environments. And this can also be linked to other terms that are being used now, sustainable agricultural movements, uh, eco-health and agroecology. So a lot of development work that goes into trying to create sustainable food systems, particularly in the global south, for example, are using and integrating these very more holistic ways of approaching development, actually in terms of food production at a small scale small farm holders, is notions like eco-health. So to decrease health disparities and food health conditions through mechanisms that promote sustainable ecosystems. And when we tie that specifically with things like agroecology, 
an approach to sustainable agriculture that views arable regions and ecosystems to consider with the ecological impact of agricultural practices. So we're taking together these very much overlap notions of agroecology, eco-health, environmental nutrition, and dietary biodiversity. But it really shows, I would say, in the last 10, 20 years, more and more ways of how people are looking at sustainable development in a very ecosystem, holistic way, looking at agriculture in that way. I mean, obviously, you know, the biologists in the room have always think and thought about systems approach in sort of ecosystems. But the sort of taking the ecosystem approach to doing agriculture is not exactly how the history of American agriculture, the history of agriculture actually came about. So we can talk about integrated pest management today, but that wasn't the thinking of the 1940s, nor was it even thinking much even during the Green Revolution, for example. And so we're thinking about these integrated systems of environment and agriculture. So what I wanted to really emphasize in this, this action-based approach to food justice, really be realized in a system again, using terms of social justice and solidarity that's built on these local and regional food production chains and food systems. I mean, no one expects community gardens to meet all the potential local food demands or dietary diversity needs in the future. I think this came up with David Saul mentioned as well. They you know, obviously, uh, we're still going to do things. I think it's another session, too. Not everything's going to be able to come local. We're still going to have to have this relationship with the world. But at the end of the day, when it comes to food production, I think we can strive to make it, of course, as local as possible. I mean, even in New York City, people say, oh, you can't grow enough food to feed New York City. Obviously, just by using rooftop gardens and urban agriculture. And you know, there have been some interesting studies done at the different centers, like at NYU. And, uh, they've shown that, well, in fact, you can. I mean, you could feed people within a 100 mile radius uh, within New York City. Because you have to think of the, the acres and the acres of lawns and unutilized land that's being churned up, for example. There is that possibility. I mean, think of the acres of land that are mowed every Saturday morning just on Long Island, for example. I mean, that's thousands and thousands of acres of food, basically, that being produced. Um, but the real notion, I think, particularly in urban agriculture, is it gives, in its most effective way, of making people aware of and becoming actively engaged in their own food systems. I mean, that's the great thing about community activism around food, <coughs> around having sort of community gardens. But, you know, we're not going to produce, produce a lot of food in the day, but the education value for the community is it's just, you, know, you can't beat that. Because it gives us a sense of awareness. It also helps in that sort of, you're not just learning about the garden, you're learning about being part of civil society, that you can be engaged, that you can make a change in your own neighborhood, ultimately, in terms of food policies, where grocery stores come and don't come, and ultimately, these issues around food justice. But we all know that local small farming systems are the most nimble, able to adapt quickly, and that would be from Amazon to Zambia. It's not just in the US. I think that uh, you know, eating locally, again, a lot of naysayers about that and the possibility of that. But regardless of, of one's trying to calculate out you know, food miles and all these other things that go into that, I just, I just want to keep emphasizing that it is the best way to educate about the food system in this country. And that's, that's why I think that if we look at these other issues I'm coming up to now, we have a globalization of world food production and consumption. How aware, all, how well, how well aware are people of those kinds of that system itself, and how deeply concerned should they be that impacts local food systems and sort of food chains, local, and impacts local food security, particularly in terms of the fluctuating prices that's going to show up your local grocery store, and ultimately the health of communities and the health disparities we see, particularly in urban and very rural communities, both in the U.S. and abroad. And it's created these health disparities that link to, again, as we saw last night, son, such an excellent job at laying out this double disease burden. I mean, we should be terrified that this is the future of the planet. I mean, we can talk about not being able to grow enough food or, or can, but what's being grown right now and consumed right now is going to lead to huge costs. And you know, to put even more of a, uh, the notion of this double disease, disease burden of both under and overnutrition is how could a country that cannot even afford a system of antiretroviral treatments for HIV-AIDS patients going to possibly be able to do dialysis? It's not going to happen. I mean, not until the, the cost of that is enormous even in the U.S. of those factors, let alone the global south, where these incidences are growing dramatically, ultimately. But, I mean, we can see that why, how did we come to this point? And again, uh, Sandra shed some light on that last night. I want to sort of reiterate the disruptions that we see then that created this double disease burden 
is a driven part of the policy to encourage agricultural subsidies, discriminatory, discriminatory trade barriers, and very aggressive marketing of processed food and beverage products. We all know that and, and see how that that's basically has impact not only the U.S. food system, but this is now impacting really a global food system. And it's further exacerbated by large-scale shifts to industrial agriculture, including supply technology, where monocropping, cash crop production strategies have led to the erosion of this dietary biodiversity, dietary diversity, in really local food environments. And that's had a real impact, clearly, on people's ability to deal with infectious disease, or even now this emerging double disease burden, everything from micronutrient deficiencies and the like. So where you can just say, well, calories continue to increase, but the other aspect of diversity has been definitely underlined. So, you know, whether we look at this as the feast and famine, the global paradox of feast and nutrition, I mean, we kind of review from what, going from what Saul said on the time, of this the green revolution, nutrition transition, this public health issue we're dealing with, that farmers produce enough food for everyone, but hunger still exists. What's going on with that? And we're still looking at ways that technology can and cannot help us deal with this, how we wrestle with this. And I just sort of point, this is actually from a Scientific American special issue from a few, few years ago, but the notion of food as medicine and how we deal with that kind of medicalization of things like obesity or food, and how we sort of struggle with that in part. So, you know, this fluctuates back and forth, depending on the FAO, WHO numbers, but we're right at sort of a billion and a billion, so it's balancing out. And that, it's not ironic, I think, that this double C burden has come about because of this balancing of those that are over and under nourished, just in terms of the sheer numbers, for example. And, you know, not to get into these numbers specifically, but, you know, you essentially find that uh, the billion overweight, 300 million that were last guy's obese by BMI, by mass index. So you have these type 2 diabetes, fat cardiovascular disease, hypertension, strokes, and cancer, every other metabolic thing is going to go along with these, these things as well. But the key cause, I think, is clearly consumption of energy dense foods again, high saturated fats, sugars, reduced physical activity. And this is what we refer to sort of these obesogenic environments. And sort of the globalization of obesogenic environments is really the biggest concern. And here's just a quick uh, sort of projecting into the future what we can find in terms of rates of diabetes. And you can see by looking here into 2030, you can see that high rates clearly in, in India, Southeast Asia, for example, are going to be the greatest growth. There's no doubt about it. The projections are really large for already happening. In fact, I would imagine, uh, Sanjay, you're probably very well aware of this. And this, we don't have to wait until 2030. This is going to be happening in the next decade. This is going to happen by 2020, or that, which is even more and more scary uh, issues. I just want to sort of highlight a couple of, of things that, that when we look at things like body mass index as an indicator of changes in consumption, changes in basically looking at the food environments change dramatically. Whether this was amongst the people we saw back in World War II, and I was going to add to what some of the comments Saul said about that, you know, the high rates of diabetes amongst the people in the American Southwest, is because what came to World War II were subsidies, and those subsidies were white flour, Lard, basically, and sugar. And what, what do you make out of those three things? <laughs> fry bread. Fry bread. So you can find that fry bread sort of symbolizes, in many ways, this change in more traditional to these sort of diets, these obesogenic environments, in addition to the sedentism and other things that have been going on. What I want to point out here, if you look, just pick some countries out, and it's surprising, I think, that uh, although there was no data, a lot of things that Sandra showed us because that's a whole other question why there's no data from South Africa. But you can see where there is data, it's quite, it's amazing. Uh, if you look at the BMIs, it's 67, it's you know, approaching the high BMIs in South Africa very similar to that in the US, though we still see South Africa very much as a global south. And the same thing with countries like Haiti, for example, where they have most females, pretty high BMI rates. What's going on? And particularly, you know, if you sort of pull apart, uh, not only with by country, but even within country, some of these things can start to come out by looking, sort of tracking, and seeing the changes that have taken place in the food system, in the sort of environmental nutrition of these countries. For Haiti, it's simple. It's a matter of the entire red rice production which is gutted by our own subsidies and cheap pricing in the U.S. And that, what came with that was an incredible huge influx of highly processed foods and the like. Not to mention the food. Problems with Haiti, that's one other added burden, of course, is this double burden as well as so everything else that's impacting Haiti over the last decade or more. Now, I've highlighted both Zambia and Zimbabwe. You know, they're 
formerly northern and southern Rhodesia, British colony, and uh, why are these differences so great? It looks like they're overweight and obese in terms of looking at the females. You have 18.6% uh, in Zambia, but 48.9% in Zimbabwe. Why, why, why such that big difference? What's, what's going on? And I bet like, a very large difference between that's 18.6 for, for females, and say, this is just BMI 130, if you look over to males, it's 7.5, where it's like 48.9, you know, 15.3% difference between females and males. And having worked in Zambia on other issues, I saw this, you know, what's, why is it so different from Zimbabwe? Well, on one hand, Zimbabwe, besides having several what, tens of thousands of percent of inflation and a huge you know, sort of transition in its own government, very fluctuating and volatile government, to say the least, depending heavily on, on food aid, and obviously that food aid is very much restricted and sort of controlled by the government and the same president they have to this day. But also this huge influx, you see, just a bit of a lot of processed foods, both food aid, bringing calories in, and other processed foods as well. But still, I just sort of scratched my head and said, yeah, but that's going on in Zambia too. Because of difference in political systems and shifting post-colonial, so why is the difference there? Then I, I, got, I looked at the day a little closer and said, well, it actually varies substantially when you look across the country. So if you look, for example, in urban areas like Harare and Zimbabwe, or you look at the soccer exam in these two capital cities. Actually, they're almost the same between these two countries. What you find is, for example, in Zambia, if you go to the western region, the very dry region on the border of Angola, the rates are more like down at like 7% or 5%. If you go into the more northeast region of Zambia, which is close to, on the border of the Democratic Republic of Congo, a very more tropical system, guess what? The rates are more like 7 So. I think what's interesting to see is not only in urban environments, for example, where the rates are more, more like 30 or so, is the importance of this thing, data just based on BMI. It's important to understand, I think, not only historically the transition these countries have gone in, but even today to try to understand you know, where can we maybe intervene in this food system? Where, why do we have such high rates in certain localities within countries, be it urban or sort of, sort of certain regions within these countries, old? And I'm just pointing this out because I think for a lot of uh, work that's dealing with the interventions in terms of reducing, I know it seems odd to talk we're going to reduce obesity in places like Zambia. I think if I told my students that, they'd go, isn't that in Africa? You know, isn't that, that you know, sub-Saharan Africa? Don't they have all this food aid going there? And we're talking about obesity, what's, what's going on with that? But I think it's, it's useful both as a lesson to sort of pull apart within country based but I think it's also important to understand this is an indicator of the massive change in food systems that are ongoing right now, BMI itself. But also, the other something that may seem to be more esoteric at first, but actually has a lot of meaning to it, is all the major commodities are very well outlined in, in terms of uh, you know, the tonnage that comes in and out of countries or imported. But there's also this category that sort of looks together all the sort of processed, prepared and processed food commodities. It's called not else well specified, but it's basically it's not rice or corn or soybeans or things like that. And you can see that in some of these same countries, like in Zambia and Zimbabwe back in the day, these several hundred percent increases. And look at Haiti, an 800 percent increase in the importation of these highly processed foods between 94 and 2004. And it doesn't surprise us that, I mean, you know, there's correlation and causation, but I think if you want to look deeply at these numbers, there is something going on here in terms of just the numbers of the amount of import of these processed foods that we know are linked to within our own society. These changes in the food system and, and changes that are adding and contributing to this double disease burden we ultimately see. Now, obviously we can talk all day about corporate marketing and how savvy they are and just penetrating into every market possible. And Coke is, is really keen of that. I mean, just this terminology, this is from a uh, 2006 annual report, but Think locally, refresh globally. I mean, think about that. It's telling a lot. The idea is that you should refresh globally with a Coca-Cola company. Everyone should be drinking a Coke product, of which there are thousands of them, and they create 300 to 500 a year, uh, for example, new products. They basically go into any local community around the planet. We talk about water issues, that's one of the topic, but they basically they look at local drinks. <laughs> modify them and then package them and, and ultimately sell them. But the thinking locally is that they argue, well, we're giving people locally, you know, opportunities. 
we opening up? Do we locally produce this stuff? Do we locally bottle this stuff? But the reality is, you know, well, what's that linked to? You know, what's, what's the larger food system transition that's going to go with drinking incredibly high amounts of with the liquid candy, that you could call it, or all of things that are high in empty calories in the day? But, you know, there's also this kind of countervailance that we constantly struggle with between the food industry and the drink industry. And you may not be able to read this, but I'll read it. And, you know, and we all recognize the generic label in the past. And it basically says, you might be surprised to learn who thinks about your child's nutrition as much as you do. Any guesses to who, what company this might be? That's deeply concerned about your child's nutrition. I'm loving it, yeah. McDonald's is the company. So I mean, they're they're, they're playing all, all sides, you know. And I think in different talks already that I've just listened to the last couple of days, this kind of comes up both in the food and drink industry with respect to, you know, if you're one of these large multinational food companies like Kraft and Foods, for example, you're going to provide every kind of health-related, health-providing food. You want to go along that track with healthy eating. At the same time, you can provide everything that's creating the unhealthy environment as well. You can find both sides of that at the, end of, at the end of the day. And I want to throw in just a sort of, and other things that are coming up, I know, in the talks uh, is questions of consumption of waste. I just want to bring this up a little bit. This is a recent, uh, on, I guess, World Environment Day. Consumerism has led us to become used to an excessive daily waste of food. This is clearly talking about, uh, Pope Francis is talking really about not to the West, both Western Europe and the U.S. in particular, but I think would now put a lot into what we see happening in the global south, particularly in the global Zimbabwe. But you know, so the notion of sort of throwing food away is like stealing from the table before. It's a very strong statement, and obviously I think Pope Francis will come up with stronger statements in the future. But the idea here is to think about you know, how we recycle this thing. I know the EPA would hear a lot more about sort of food waste challenges and other things that we go through. Uh, a week. But I just want to bring that notion up because with the consumption comes that waste. So with the overconsumption, with the change in the food system, it is coming a great deal of waste at the same time. And so it's it's like not only is it overconsumption, it's overconsumption with a lot of waste on top of that. So it's really waste waste. I think it's over, over the top at the end of the day. Okay, I want to just hit upon uh, this notion of environmental nutrition again. Is relationship to adaptations with respect to obesogenic environments. And when Salt introduced this notion that if we think about ourselves as a species, we're trapped in this, we say, paleo body adapted genetically to a foraging lifestyle, as hunters and gatherers. And people always argue that the shift then has led us that went to the path of agriculture and becoming sedentary, and eventually industrialization of the food supply has led to diet related health problems that we face. And I wanted to to add some of what Saul was saying, is we have to realize that uh, you know, the domestication process just didn't happen overnight. And I know Saul had said this stuff years ago, how barley was re-domesticated again and again and again. It's like a Kickstarter every few centuries you start up again. And you know, people often say, well, 10, 12,000 years, suddenly we knew how to deal with animals and plants. I mean, I hate to tell us this, but I think people knew a lot about animal plant behavior even before our own species. We know exactly how things happen. So it was mad. other choices were being made there, ultimately. It wasn't just like a Eureka who figured out how to you know, domesticate this plant. People through fire ecology and helping along plants and culling livestock herds, wild herds, was happening for tens of thousands of years before we got to the point of domestication. But whenever we finally got to that point where there was no return, ultimately, you know, centuries and millennia that came later, we clearly are facing that now. We were clearly genetically adapted to that lifestyle. So there's been a lot of discussion lately, we think, about paleo diets. No. I mean, from the 19th century onward, people have been talking about how we should eat as an ape, as a human, what we're destined to eat. Uh, basically, you see here, this is, guess what? This is from, you know, not surprisingly, right? A uh, serial advertisement. <laughs> eat like a cave woman, to be slim and rape since 1931. So we've always been sort of trapped in this notion of trying to figure out, well, who are, what are we, who are we, what are we meant to eat? What sort of thing do we 
humans are supposed to eat. And obviously, as anthropologists, we often get this question, well, what's, a, what's a human really supposed to eat? And if we can get to the omnivore side and, and talk about that a bit, but, uh, or even in terms of what we're supposed to eat, I think it links to a larger question that Saul was bringing up. It's an ethnivore question. Because what we eat is just a matter of what we need to eat. What we become so deeply embedded in the myths and traditions of our own cultures and societies when we say what to eat. So it's not just strictly a nutrition question, it's also a question of these other traditions that go along with that. Now Sandra had laid out quite nicely this notion of the Barker hypothesis, but I want just to reiterate this again because this really is back to this kind of adaptation of hunters and gatherers. It's also referred to as a thrifty phenotype, this ability to be able to conserve, but if you look at it in terms of adaptation, with the parent nutritional status of a mother during pregnancy, it will lead to continued growth disruptions and low birth weight. The child who's better adapted to chronic food shortages. Well, we're not better adapted in lots of other ways, and clearly are impacted in our own growth and development. But from a strictly survival perspective, sure, it's an amazing evolutionary adapted strategy to have this happen, uh, just you know, to, to make sure that pregnancy goes to term and there's child survival. Now, the nature of the quality of life of that child, et cetera, is what we find today. So the impact on everything from cognitive development and these other kind of developing diseases that will come earlier in life than they should ultimately. Um, but the idea is that, you know, problematic to this, as we saw last night, that the child develops in, we can say, sort of more energy-rich environment, at least, or we call it obesogenic, but a more affluent food system, the more likely to develop diabetes and all these other chronic diseases that send you Last night. And with the rapidly changing food environments, it's been even before the age of 10, and now to bring Sanders talk, I'm going to keep ratcheting this down, which is even more depressing. And she said it's the younger and younger ages, too, as you mentioned, for example. So uh, there's this notion of adaptation. And although better, of course, adapted to chronic food shortages, obviously they're going to suffer from COVID. I also want to link up just briefly again to reiterate this notion of the epigenetic factors. And, uh, and you know, the notion of epigenetics is clearly revolutionizing the way we not only think about adaptation and growth and development, but we're still, we still have, to, particularly anthropologists, we have yet to sit down and rethink the entire evolution of our species in epigenetic terms. I mean, it's, it's, so, it's so simple genomics, you know, a DNA, we can go through this stuff, but now it's all changing. The notion of a very flexible, behavioral systems that are linked into things that aren't changing the genome and the DNA code, but definitely changing the ability for that code to be realized in terms of expressed, for example. And this is where a lot of interesting research is looking back at things like population-based health disparities. Why do we find such high rates of hypertension in our communities? You know, in the past, and same thing, why do we find such high rates of diabetes amongst Native Americans? In the past, it's always going to a different question. Well, there must be some genetic sequence in Native Americans, particularly making them susceptible. Well, the reality is for all these major diseases, guess what? This is genetics of what? Our species. It's our species genome. But whether that's realized or not, it comes back to this environmental impact, uh, an epigenetic impact of maybe decades, if not centuries, of adapting to different kinds of social and economic conditions. So that's all the trends play in these, these health disparities. So and these biocultural linkages between the environments and the nutrition transition itself, we would find more and more about. Particularly as we see why are certain groups, for example, in South Asia more rapidly changing than others. Is it a question of genomics or is it a question of these larger term maybe epigenetic factors involved with that? But really I think it puts us at a critical juncture of understanding things like environmental nutrition, adaptation, <laughs> approach, questions of food policy and development, this kind of biocultural interface of our own human agency and action, bio and forces, I think, to really closely consider these moral and spiritual dimensions of our own food choices and consumption patterns. So, you know, what are the ethics of eating and how do we reconsider ethical eating itself when we think about these linkages and these transitions ultimately here? And I'm just showing this because this is sort of conceptualized and it's still kind of wrap my head around this, is that when you think of the exposure of a mother, it's really to be impacting her, her grandchildren. As you can see there, the mother's first generation, the second generation of fetus, there's also the reproductive cells in the third generation being formed at the same time. And just to try to think about that, our thinking is, is barely beyond two generations, but think about two generations. The impact of food policies and interventions of micronutrients or not, during, especially during uh, perennial care, is having a huge impact 
on generations that haven't even been born yet. So that kind of relationship and understanding, I think, really sort of puts the pressure on for us to be, I guess, more urgent, as it might be, in trying to combat this double disease burden that everything that goes, goes along with it. And as was mentioned last night, these mice. And the hope of this, and I didn't want to seem all you know, doomsday about it, is that we do find that even sort of micronutrient supplementation is a way in which these gene expressions can be shut off and other things can be turned on. And there is an ability for the environmental influence that can be very positive. Uh, not that it's a panacea to everything, but we do find that there is that opportunity out there for intervention that can have a real impact on stopping some of these things that we see are maybe genetic related but only express in, in the context of not having the proper supplementation of dietary interventions that are possible, possibly out there. So back to Saul's ethnobore. I was thinking about this more last night. The ethnobore's biocultural dilemma. I think about I thought about the ethnobore's dilemma, like the omnivore's dilemma. I had a bit of biocultural, especially when we saw it. I had to I think, have that extra added to that. But just sort of this link between sort of indigenous knowledge, the system that's out there, the food, myth, ritual, and tradition, but also this notion of the environmental nutrition, so the impact on, on the human body, and so the uh, measurable impact as it might be. And everything going on between that, between this genome, the genomic structures, and the epigenome itself that are very flexible to adaptation, and how this is linked to a larger sort of food system. I didn't put any Specific example now, but we're just trying to make sure that, that the broad spectrum from indigenous knowledge, which would include, of course, the myth, the ritual, the traditions, the sacred, the secular, all within that, but at the same time thinking about its impact, particularly the environmental nutrition aspect of that, how the changing environments are changing in a way that's shifting not only one's epidemiological transition going on, or public health indicators, but things are also going on in that knowledge system. And What's being lost or gained and changed in that knowledge system, I think, is, is important, as important a, a research question and policy question as is the question of just the number of calories and micronutrients at the same time. So, kind of thinking this as a policy to action by informed by tradition thing, I was thinking these larger spheres, particularly given the nature of this conference, there's really there's a sacred food, there's a trust of the nation of how we view food and relate ourselves to food, so the sacred food trust. It's also very linked to sort of laws, legislation, of a public social trust that's out there. But also the you know elephant in the room there, especially particularly putting in red, is a corporate. I mean that in the sense of corporate incorporations, not just a body, but a corporate uh, responsibility. And that's you know what is the multinational food industry's responsibility and linkages with the sacred food trust and public social trust every day. How do those relate to each other? And I think that's a discussion that has to be had. I think it's a discussion that involves food policy has to be informed by tradition, so it's sacred, sacred food trust, but also by the public social trust and tradition of politics and economics of food systems. But also always going to be there as a responsibility. Because that's no doubt, I mean, we, I think we should go into this, we could go into this all day, is the impact of advertising, the impact of uh, hitting that, I guess, sandwich, but the bliss spot. I mean, you got to say sort of that sweet spot where you've got people tasting it and you want that thing. And you've created that sort of in their own food science lab at uh, your food company. And what responsibility do they have then to these not only diet related health problems in their own country, but also as a global phenomenon? So it's a responsibility that goes beyond their own policies in the U.S. for the two that. And I want to sort of just round, sort of wind, wind things up a bit by just saying that. You know, we always think of approaches to any kind of food policy, particularly whether it's domestic or maybe international, whether it's the Foreign Bill or some other policy decision that takes place in the UN, for example. Because we always think we've got a problem, we've got to solve it, right? There's a need, you've got to deal with that. But I think we realize more and more that you know, problems are complex. And I always like to think it's more a question of a challenge. You've got to meet the challenge, negotiate it, revise it, so recommendations and actions taken. It's, Really important is anthropologists have realized this for, for a very long time in the adaptation to these different systems is how people cope. And it's the most insightful understanding of, of understanding of what change or how people cope is important. Because it's in that, you know, there's this a shift from the need assessment these days in the developed world to strength assessments. It's just not start out saying what do they need, what do they need, or here's what they need. It's a question of what do people already have that they can build upon? It's a strength assessment. And just that you know, shift itself has an incredible impact on success in most developed programs. This is an asset inventory. You start out with that. That's the positive. You know, what's the advantage? 
What's the assets? What's the streets people have in the community? And then you go from there to what can be built upon. Because we've gone far too long, and the Green Revolution is an example of that, I think, of just saying, there's a problem, this is what people need. But that sort of full discussion of like appropriate technology and what's really is needed in this community. And I just want to get this notion of, of all the work that's done by Catholic Relief Services, and it's one of the, well, the and World Vision are the two biggest uh, recipients of USAID funding in terms of projects around the world. CRS works in about 100 different countries. So not to say Relief Services, they still do a lot of that, but they're clearly also focused on questions of development and really trying to work with not in its own kind of coming in with their own people, but working with local partners. So they've devised this integral human development model. You can see this by the name itself. It's really based in Catholic social teaching. But this is a model in which you're looking at sort of the shocks, the cycles, the trends, outcomes, and strategies. They use this in every project. Or they're asked to look at this model for every development project they do in whatever country that might be, just to think through the relationship of the structures and systems. But what's unique about this, which I find so, so important, though, is that it includes the spiritual and human capital. It's an asset. And really trying to, for example, call to definitely appreciate this notion that you have to look at any asset, not only in terms of physical, natural, financial, political, social, but you have to look at spiritual and human assets. And that's something I want to, to think more, I'm going to be thinking more about this week, is sort of how, how does one tap into that sort of spiritual and human uh, and ethical asset itself to really sort of move along and to more civic engagements with civil action these important factors to address these more global issues of these sort of unequal systems of distribution and these changes and the impact of these changes in the world's food systems. So they use this as a conceptual framework, I'll jump ahead of that, and just say that uh, the way they sort of link this up with this notion of a capital social teaching, the CST, is envisions the world that people can live their full potential, meaning basic physical needs sustainably, live the dignity and just and peaceful society. It's based on the rights relationship, and the keys are this holistic inner human development promotes the good of every person, the whole person, in its various dimensions, including the spiritual, promotes the integrity of creation, it's in solidarity, rights responsibilities of each person, every person and one another, there's justice and peace, and people who develop promotes the social dignity again of each person. So they're really looking at these development projects, uh, even though the US AIA funded project, but the way it's implemented these, they're trying to make it holistic as, as possible and, and not sort of you know, stepping away from or maybe avoiding or not, you know, jumping right into the fact that you know, it's always more than politics and economics. You have to look at these other dimensions that would come along of dignity and solidarity and even say like things like subsidiarity. But it's not meant to, to completely you know be the magic bullet. It's not to replace good development practitioner, things like that. And I want to end it with just an experience in Brazil. In this new community called Nova Conquista, I wanted to talk about how the food sovereignty in action is in CRS project. I'm going to bring this up. Northeast of Brazil, they just established this amazing community. They just built 30 houses. They've got 2,670 acres in Brazilian government. They're still fighting about sections of that from other land grabbers, but still. The new dimension is that this is comprised of men who have been once victims of forced labor, basically on slavery, and their families. So they're essentially able to. Two, the different organizations like the Pastoral Land Commission, for example, Pacific Tech, were able to sort of help contact the government. And the government has these teams that come in, like SWAT teams, that sort of free these people from these, they're way off in the Amazon. And what they're doing, of course, is they're altering food systems, and, are, and this is linked to us. I mean, they're either doing things like Big Iron, which shows up in your automobiles, this is all about the forced slave labor. They're deforesting areas, huge areas of tropical rainforest for the soybeans, or for cattle, ultimately, too. And so this ends up in our own food supply distribution chain. It becomes a real question of our own, the value of the food chain, the value of the food system as it comes to us. So, it so I know there's been more movement towards that. We ought to talk about fair trade. This even goes deeper than that. There's one thing about working conditions, and there's work conditions that are completely inequitable, and so we get purged and go into this notion of slavery. But the notion of the sovereignty is now they're able to make decisions as a community what they want to grow, kind of uh, how they want to go about that. They're, they, they're deeply concerned about climate change, for example, as a community. They're seeing the drought, they're wanting what's going to be the future of this. Uh, they can heavily rely on the Antioch. This, this is the northeast part of Brazil, not far from Jerusalem, which is a region where you know, Manioc are also known as cassava, you can put names, but uh, there's dry versions of this. Uh, the bitter version can grow incredibly 
or drop the soil to the very dry condition. So that's still a lot. But they're still trying to do dry land rice and grow some corn, things like that. But they also want to, through sort of food sovereignty, make sure, so sort again, of in cooperation as a community, they want to build a school, they want to help money. But I was going to say that, so at the center of everything they're doing is they're trying to create a new sustainable food system anchored in the notion of food sovereignty. And the Brazilian government is on for that. There's a lot of paperwork, but at least in, as a government, they're there to the support these people. So I think that's a model. Because you know, when you're talking to some of these individuals when I was there just last month, you know, they basically said, all we want is a piece of land. And I think that's what we need with because that's simply what the smallholder farmers of the world want. It's just their own plot of land. Just to have enough for their family, very small scale. They're not looking to become rich. They want to have a fulfilled life of being able to be a farmer and not have to be hard workers for, for the future. So thank you. We have one sound system today. Uh, I think that it's 10:35. The question is: uh, will we, I think it would be great if we had a few minutes of questions, and then have the break for the um, for the picture and for getting coffee um, after the picture, I think, would be, uh, or before whatever you would like. But you need to know that the picture will be taken. If you're drinking a cup of coffee in here, you won't get one. But uh, I just wanted to thank you very much for this challenge, and, uh, and thank you for extending what I Andrew said yesterday. But in addition to that, uh, for integrating this in new ways, and it's very exciting personally just to uh, uh, view these slides and uh, understand where where you've been able to take uh, uh, what you've been doing and. and I should have also pointed out that Barry and I have been linked for about 30 years or so now in uh, starting in Hopi uh, and moving out uh, in many, many different directions and many different projects. So I wanted you to know that. I should have said that initially. Um, I think that the, uh, the issues are many. You've raised a really important set of questions uh, and challenges for all that we've been talking about. So um, are there some key issues that would you'd like to raise. We only have one, maybe we do have another microphone. Can we get this microphone turned back on so that we can have people talking into the microphone too? Thank you. I'm going to turn this, I'm going to turn this one over. Can you bring us out here? Yeah. Three weeks ago, and Brian Chek, who spoke here last year, met with our Roman Catholic group in Washington as part of this network that you referenced. And can you go back to that slide with the model? Um, yeah. The, uh, the, um, the, the IG model. Yeah, the IG model, yeah. Um, and we, we talked specifically about that model and, and specifically the point that sustainability does not appear on that model. And you, you in explaining it, and in explaining the implications of it, you, you reference sustainability, but as a principle, and, and in that process, sustainability is not there. Which they became very defensive on the help, and we could not resolve their mission with, with that principle. Right. Uh, my short answer is on the same page. I was at CRS World Headquarters last summer, and I had the same concerns about this chart, and uh, particularly one that we're trying to relate to sort of a specific food security program. And I was arguing that there were a lot of aspects that needed to be added to this. But I, I think for their, their short answer was that we're trying to keep it simple. But I was trying to argue it's not a simple problem, it's not a simple issue, so it's going to be made more complicated. But yeah, I definitely appreciate that feedback, and, and part, part of what I hope to do is I'll continue to, to dialogue, as, as you said, to make these suggestions, make it a more holistic model. And I, I should just add that uh, this is a model that's it's basically built out with what was developed in, in, by CARE. It's essentially a, a line of assessment here, you can see, it looks at uh, life of the strategies, so it was built 
upon that. And again, that also did not have expressions of sustainability on that, that item. And I, I think that in translating that over, I, I think that I agree needs to be added. But certainly historically, at this model from CARE and what CRS developed, it's very similar. And I, I agree it needs to be added to. Absolutely. I'm, I'm glad you recognize the same problem. You've got more influence than I do, so that's a, that's a positive. Well, I'll just try to keep talking about it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I don't know. Can we get? Oh, there's a line of people over here. Oh, I'm sorry. Just, just uh, to follow up on that last point, uh, this is an issue on which I think the religious traditions have a particularly important contribution because so many of the impacts on us are very short term. The political process can't see beyond the next election. The economic process can't see beyond the Report, but the religious traditions have always had uh, an extension to many generations of their outlook. And that, that sustainability feature, I think perhaps one needs to point out this specifically religious input into that. Right. Thank you. On the question of national sovereignty or sustainability, two very quick examples. A few decades ago, when the United States discovered we could produce grain, produce rice, and ship it to Japan and sell it cheaper than Japanese produced rice, Japan put on high tariffs, which we screamed about. Japan had two arguments. First, we don't want to drive all our small rice farmers on the hillside out of business. And second, in the event of a war, we need to keep have local rice production so we can feed our people from locally produced food. Um, second example, a little bit the same spirit, Malawi, landlocked country in East Africa, where we discovered we could ship in maize, corn, and sell it cheaper than they could produce it locally. Of course, Malawi had no similar political leverage, didn't put on tariffs. We shipped in maize, drove a lot of local land out of maize production, and when we made the interesting political decision to produce ethanol from corn and the price rose, the result was massive starvation in Malawi, where the land could not, where you have basically pointed stick agriculture, and the land could not be put back into production fast enough. Yeah, I, I mean, Malawi is also an interesting case because they also have not been that complacent. They've been very resistant, actually, of recent times to sort of taking back their own traditional food systems. So, yeah, yeah. yeah you're, uh, I'm an anthropologist, too, and when I became one, uh, uh, to begin with, I was completely enamored by culture, cultural uh, access, and so forth. So I want to take the test and ask you what you really think about cultural access, uh, because uh, access and influence, I think, are the uh, hallmarks of actually uh, uh, solving some of the food security issues. So, for example, if we leave in the terms cultural access and cultural or custom and so forth, all we are doing is reifying the traditional distribution systems and the yes. traditional norms about who can eat and who can't and what food security means at the local levels. For example, I think we all know that the wealthy eat better than the poor in terms of quantity and diversity. I think we are beginning to realize some of the gender differences. I'm always amazed by the cultural restrictions on women, girls, pregnant women, uh, in terms of proteins. Uh, they can't eat fish, they can't eat eggs, the boys get more proteins. I've seen it, I've seen the household distributions done by women, by uh, giving more to the men and uh, withholding for their, their daughters the protein and giving it to their sons, even uh, in so many cultures of the planet, especially those with some preference all the time, like the Middle East, Montreal, and, and lots of other places. Uh, then sacred foods. When they put those gorgeous foods on their doorsteps, 
and then the mask then come out representing the ancestors, and the children are inside, and the women are inside, and they'll be whipped. Uh, and then what happens to the food? Strange things on the next day. All the young men of the village have known it. So, you know, access is a very, very interesting concept in this whole diagram of uh, whether it's being driven in a cultural tradition or whether we're maintaining it. So I know Catholic Living Services and a lot of these projects do a much better job than you want, might gather uh, from actually looking at yes. this chart. Uh, but I don't know how sensitive they really are to uh, wealth and gender distinctions and food distribution. So you might want to comment on that. And one more thing. In terms of, I would say, uh, somewhat of a romance uh, about uh, uh, biodiversity in traditional societies and the number of species and differences and so forth, I think that's a romance uh, because a lot of these societies were located in microecologies where things were also very seasonal. And I know people will tell me, you know, living in villages and some of the places I did live in. Uh, that we can only eat this at this time, and it was only it, it might be a glut at that time, or even an adequate supply, but it wasn't available the rest of the time. They might have 10 or 12 different varieties of maize or of cassava and something like that. I mean, you know, last time we were used to the store, or the, the problems we discussed yesterday. But nevertheless, all the other fresh products that could not be stored uh, or left in the ground that were extremely, extremely seasonal, and they were only in that little microecology, even though the next microecology over would have other things. So, you know, on a worldwide basis, there was huge biodiversity, but the people localized in small areas is very, very narrow. Um, so I think we over romanticize that mission. So you might want to Okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll work backwards quickly. I think, yeah, maybe over and around and size and degree of biodiversity, but I think it's important to realize that even in that micro, just that people have that and maintain the traditional knowledge of that small microecology system itself. I think it's important in the context of where they're trying to be stripped away from because it is their backup, particularly as a coping strategy. Uh, just quickly in terms of the, uh, when in the emergency food world, they're moving heavily to thinking more about accountability. And I know all these reports have been coming out you know, sort of after everything in Rwanda, after Sudan, after this, in the Horn of Africa. It's been interesting because they keep pushing a lot that the accountability has finally laid out very specific questions about you just can't talk to the leaders. When you're talking about food distribution, you have to make sure that you speak with everyone. And my hope is that from that dialogue, at least for emergency food situations, that's going to translate into more longer term development projects, which will ask essentially the same kinds of questions. Who's being targeted? And are, are you, eventually, are you really meeting the needs of the entire community? And, and that's, that's a hard transition to make. But I agree that that's been a more recent shift in terms of the way of thinking about all those people that we need to ask in these situations. Yeah, okay. Good to see you. Could you identify yourself? Oh, let me just bring in just to bring you to and, and Please. And identify yourself. Herb Free. I just want to make what I hope will sound like a practical comment, a practical suggestion. In the context of your looking for uh, spiritual side, uh, assistance for the spiritual side, it seems to me you, me, anyone who feels like this, requires all the help they can possibly get. And one would put other, other, uh, Feelings aside for the moment, I think it would be useful to speak to the leaders of every major religious organization, certainly in this country and perhaps in the world. Uh, they have a certain amount of clout, and uh, especially if you're fighting corporate greed, you need some sort of clout, and some sort of clout that sounds righteous. And this would be, perhaps even for them, a useful thing to do. And so that is my suggestion. Go to the heads of the organized churches, uh, in fact, internationally. Start with the Vatican if you want. But, but uh, do something. Thanks, yeah, and I'm hoping that something can be done along the lines of the Farm Bill coming up. Yeah. Um, 
Um, so I'll thank you for such an informative talk. And um, I just wanted to connect a few dots that sort of as a new kid on the block, I'm a gold star. Um, I didn't realize some of the things that Saul pointed out yesterday and you also referred to where the tryptophan is such an important precursor for the niacin. And the tryptophan is also necessary for serotonin. So if you're using your tryptophan for your niacin, are you going to be mentally able? Well, my, the short answer is a D, and the four Ds is dementia. And that's because of that. Well, I suspected that. And, yeah, exactly. and so what I'm wondering is, is, is the problem of obesity and the wrong food is in one category, and then let's say there's the right food, which might be the raw corn, or the raw barley, or the raw beans, or the raw wheat, or the raw rice, without it having the recipe delivered, the recipe for offsetting the niacin problem with the with the alkaline, or the beans, or the soy, or all of the different things. Could the religions that are involved in the aid offer some ritualistic recipes that wouldn't involve education as much as to, you know, do this. You have to make the food this way for a ritualistic reason. But within that ritual would be contained the correct way to treat the food so it can be nutritious. Yeah, and I, I think people that do food aid are very uh, thinking about that a lot in terms of local traditions. I mean, clearly, in sub saharan Africa, a lot of these experimenting which can surround that by processing. So you, if you treat the same way you treat the traditional breeds of organs, as sort of millets are, you basically have, have a way to get around things like water. It is tapping into sort of using a different grain, but in the same way you've done the tradition, both through the ritual and yeah. And is the um, this oil shale that's probably going to replace the, uh, the biofuel with the corn, is that going to create this glut of corn? that's then going to be used to feed the world. So that need to treat the corn properly for nutrition is going to become even more important. Is there, is there a week-long conference on hydrofracking next week? <laughs> that's a long conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, I think what will happen is you know, the way the corn market is, people will switch back to soybeans. Corn price will drop down. They'll find something else to do with that. Well, it'll, it'll be more animals, produce more beef, produce more meat for the increasing meat consumers of the world. That's what's going to happen to it. Okay, thank you. Make it cheaper. Unfortunately. Edmund Robinson, uh, thank you so much for your presentation. Before I was a minister, uh, I was a lawyer, and the word sovereign to me, I want to critique it because I think it's important when we talk about human rights to try to get some terminology that will last and will really define some real problems. Um, and sovereign. To me, is the uh, agency aspect of a nation state. Uh, the ownership and the right, uh, the, the set of rights that occur originally the king, the, 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 the top, uh, same yeah. rock. Uh, so you know, it seems to me when you're using food sovereignty, you're talking about some of that and some of these, uh, the Malawi examples, are pretty good examples of sort of the way that, that the uh, uh, Pakistan. Complains about U.S. drone strikes in their territory. That's they're invading our sovereignty. So, in that sense, but but with with food politics, it seems to be that sub-national groups can also complain that their power over their own food is being taken away from them. Largely by corporations, often instead of national policy. So, it seems to be a more general term might be autonomy. Food autonomy rather than food sovereignty, it's a little less confusing. Just a suggestion. Yeah. On that, I think the reason this has a movement, the farmers, small farms, came up with sovereignties, actually to rise that as a vertical. Basically, they have people start talking about this notion of nation state sovereignty, sovereignty of small farmers on the same, you know, putting themselves at the same level, being like a nation state being able to make those kind of decisions and having those kind of rights. But I, I agree. It's the same thing, I know Ellen will probably clarify tonight a lot of this question of food rights. The notion of rights and get you into that same kind of legalistic question as well. It's like ethnovore. Any new neologism can open up a great uh, uh, new vista, but it also can be I agree.
Thank you, Paul Carr. Uh, my question, uh, I'd like to suggest, uh, my question is, is it possible to add to your rights the right of truth and advertising? You know, well, this is the big issue in the United States and any developed country, because I mean, a lot of our patterns are really different, but the average person is determined by advertising. I mean, there are laws that try to curb that. I guess uh, the corporation would say our advertising is true. It's the interpretation of that truth. Yeah, how could it could be enforced. Yeah. I think that's the key. Exactly. Exactly. Right. I think that would be a job for the Trump administration, really. I agree. Yeah. And then obviously, the problem with food production, you have the EPA, food and drug administration, and the Department of Agriculture all have seen different aspects of that. And that's really so true. Yeah. No, I agree. Yeah. 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 I'm Roger Brown. Um, I'm struck by your comment and Saul's about them, the value of the local farmer, the local having control over their food, being able sometimes to grow a good percentage of their own. Um, and But there's an awful lot of movement of people into the cities. Their the cities are in existence. Um, I was, um, was recently in China where I actually was in a region um, um, where the there's a lot of farming in every little possible and available inch. But then I read in the New York Times two weeks ago, the government wants to move in 10 years 250 million people into the cities. Um, and that seems very alarming. They're already moving the people out to Tibetan grasslands, people who know how to make a, to make a life. Uh, and they, I don't know about the China situation, but the governmental Organizational stresses uh, in this way seem alarming to me. Yeah, that's, that's another long conversation because if you do in the case of China, I mean, where this food producer is going, who's going to make that up, is going to be going to follow an industrial food model in terms of the production. Whereas we know what's happening, food production is going to be taking place in sub Saharan Africa as well to, to make up for those people going into the cities and the factories and stuff. And basically, going to be importing by the land grab in different parts of the world. Demi Miller, and I'm looking at the, the way to incorporate sustainability into this model, and it seems to be around the area of accountability. Uh, no accountant would dare present a legitimate budget in which the capital budget limits were mixed with the expenditures and income budgets, um, and every good capitalist is trying to do exactly that. And the global corporations are all about externalizing costs, which means consuming natural capital, social capital, human and spiritual capital, and calling it income. So the, what we need is, is real uh, integrity in accounting, in accounting and accounting that can stand up against the corporations and keep pointing out that these are real capital stocks and they can't be converted to income and put down at the bottom line. Yeah, just use the term asset. I think she's right now. Yeah. 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 I'm, I'm Emily Messer, and I want to congratulate you on all the block of book you talk. And I have one question, one about on clarification, um, and also one very general question that I hope we'll continue to pursue on this evening and throughout the conference. So the point of clarification regards that very impressive figure of the work of the, uh, the foods that are not uh, simple whole foods, but are, are some kind of composite foods. Can you clarify for us, you know, what's, what are the foods that are going into that 642% increase that you uh, pledged on there? Because my immediate thought when you talk about um, of the, these more industrialized foods, you know, things like you know, Twinkies, you know, Twinkies are that, and, you know, we're not talking about Twinkies, so what are, what are we talking about? Well, I, I mean, just by definition, would be those things that would be edible and packaged. So I'm assuming it's going to be probably things like crackers, shell staple things, cracker cookies, canned things, all sorts. Um, but are they basically included anything in the grocery store that's shelf stable? They would include in that sort of thing. Yes. But so I, 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 I agree that it'd be worth sort of getting on the that, ground. That's not just the courts so like Len that the uh, that the Millers spent the Millers and the used to International grain trading firm spent a lot of food processors spent a lot of money lobbying. No, no, this is all other stuff you find on the shelf. All right. And the general question is 
that really wonderful final example you gave us of the Brazilian community of former forced laborers who have been assisted by the Catholic institutions and also the Catholic institutions. I know from our conversation yesterday at lunch, we're also working with government like, on these programs. Um, what, we, what, what I continue to see in Brazil, and I'll be presenting the Brazil case study tonight also, is that there's this wonderful, really very fluid interaction between civil society organizations, including many of the church organizations, and government programs. And the question that I raised very basically for us to be thinking about here are whether the, the institutions of government, which are so particularly the right, those that come under the right to food, kinds of food programs um, of, of various sorts of of helping people become more self-reliant or helping those who can't be self-reliant and less fulfill their right to food. Those are filling the gaps that are left from community process because ideally every household, every community is self-reliant. So government's trying to, to fill those, those gaps that are also then uh, left by the local organizations that are trying to help those who are not self-reliant. On the other hand, the um, local organizations are trying to also then reciprocally fill the gaps that are left by government programs. So the, the basic, the underlying essential question that, that some of us have is whether um, these are best left as independent institutions or whether um, they really should be working more closely in coordination. How, how, how do these dynamics and the interrelationships between the public and the private work themselves out. And I'm sure you can think about that as someone who's there from the perspective of mm -hmm. the Catholic institutions, but also thinking about that. Mm -hmm. Right. That sounds like a lot of new conversations. <laughs> I'll, I'll just say, I, I bring that up in the context of our own farm room. And then we'll go right at that point. For those that really want that nutrition bill separated out, is they want, you can say, the slack or the responsibility being put on civil society, not under the federal government. And I think that's the same with the truth in Brazil, that same kind of debate goes back and forth about the local government. So, so, but I think in you know, civil society or these organizations are just trying to bridge the gap all the time with that change and sort of shift in the sand. Mm -hmm. well, <laughs> I'm curious as to whether there's been an expansion, certainly uh, in labeling We've decided to label them organic, non organic. There is also a movement of not only what is raised, but the process of raising it. And other than, let's say, free trade coffee, are there other movements so that we could understand by you know, labeling uh, whether we are contributing to the injustice? Or I mean, on the top of my head, I, I don't know the exact names of it, but there are definitely different products that will say, you know, done by after animal products, the ethics of that. You know, different states and different sort of organizations have come up with their own labels that people look for. And I mean, you don't have to talk about some of those names, but some of you probably know the audience that will say whether if it's been the stamp of approval, not from the federal government, but it's been these autonomous, respectable organization to basically put the stamp of approval that has been raised ethically, for example, or for example, it's been raised in a sustainable food system. Uh, as well, and, and a, lot, a lot of people actually prefer more stricter organic standards, for example, like in the state of Oregon, because they're more stricter than the USDA. So some people don't think about the USDA with further standardization, with further substantial approval. That, that, that is a growing movement. So ethics of food, what's going on. Hi, I'm Mark Cooper, John McKinnon Lee. I don't know if you've addressed this already, but um, regarding the recent Supreme Court decision, which uh, either gives or reinforces a corporation's rights similar to uh, an individual. Um, can you comment on to what extent that is either going to help or hinder any attempts to improve the, um, the, the food industry? I mean, my short sure answer is I don't think it's been a Supreme Court decision in the last 10 years that that's been to the advantage of the personal consumer. That's, <laughs> that's <laughs> Sorry, I put it off. That is really a preface to my question. I'm Charlotte Brewer, I'm a vegetarian, and we did have a couple of years to really talk about ethical eating, so I've been paying some attention. And I'm just wondering, is it possible 
for religious organizations to help all of us stand up to the kinds of decisions that the Supreme Court has made. I mean, they let the Monsanto um, seed users, they, that was the decision that was made. And now how do we help these corporations, how do we make them become more responsible? And we are the other circle of responsibility. Is it through our religions that we can best be led? Well, I think someone said, said earlier that there's, there's great power, of course, these big things that come together in certain action about things. But I think we're still waiting for that to happen. I mean, so it's the purpose of Yeah, I'm hoping, I mean, I saw them creating, as, as a group, creating a kind of declaration, I guess, is trying to sort of frame that, that out. But I mean, there are different national movements, you know, like the, uh, I know that, for example, the, the National Catholic Rural Life Center. Um, when, when I get their email newsletter, there there's these amazing networks of interfaith groups that have been food issues that basically try to get individuals to, to write their comments and write stuff the farm bill and things like that. But I, I agree there needs to be much more, let's say, persuasive lobbying power when it comes to lobbying powers with the book to come by and that the great money you have to have behind them, you can see. Change the focus a little bit. Um, there's a long tradition in Latin America of the liberation theology based communities, and some of that new community seems to have some of the characteristics of some of the, maybe not so political characteristics of the based community. Oh, it did. Is it out of that tradition? Absolutely, yeah. So it was, there's some discussion with the Pope Francis has, um, shall I say, at least tolerance for the, the um, Liberation theology in Latin, Latin America is, is can we expect to see more of this kind of. Um, <laughs> I, I think there will be a much more open discussion about the spirit of liberation theology in its original sort of formation, more radicalization of it. I think the depth will continue to not give a stamp of approval. But I think when it's translated into things like these kinds of actions, that's where you see sort of support. I don't want to say it's kind of a roundabout support, but in the spirit of these kinds of movements and sort of involving just the peasant populations, I think we have much more open discussion about that. And I think that's what everyone's hoping for. So, thank you. Thanks. All right, it's time for the photo. Everybody have a friend. Rina, thanks. I got your emails. I've only just picked because I overslept. I only oh, just picked up worry. my emails, and all, but I gather there was a problem uploading. Video. But this is up now. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs>